we go. Okay, I've shared, I've recorded. Uh, I think I need to start this. Then I need to hide this. Hide, there we go. Um, so yes, good morning, everyone. I wanna talk about a few things. Uh, we'll do a little bit of uh, background. Uh, we'll review some things. I also wanna talk a little bit about the course evaluations and the exam that's coming up. Uh, so those kinds of things. We've got two more classes left uh, and uh, I wanna make sure we can cover everything. So let's get started. Uh, today, uh, this will be sort of the first uh, few minutes, maybe the first 15 minutes, we'll talk about the final class and the quiz and the exams and so on. Uh, then we'll talk a little bit about course evaluations, why they're interesting and why they're important. Uh, and then we will review a little bit of probability theory and also uh, prospect theory. Those are the two things that came up the most uh, for things that people wanted to review. So Jonathan Barron's uh, three different approaches to studying and understanding probability and a little bit about the prospect theory value function. So we'll spend maybe about five or 10 minutes uh, on that stuff. Then we'll talk about problem solving for the first half, uh, finish a little bit more problem solving in the second half, and then talk about creativity. So let me first talk about the exam. As you know, there's a quiz today. Quiz number four is today. Uh, it'll be available online as soon as the class is over. And then quiz five is next week. Uh, and remember, I'm going to take the uh, four highest quizzes. So if you take all five, I'll drop the lowest. Uh, if you've only taken four quizzes, I would drop the lowest, which would be a zero because it would be the one you didn't take. Uh, so regardless, you should have uh, a chance to get four good quiz uh, marks in there. Next week's quiz is going to be comprehensive in the sense that I'll throw in a few questions uh, from the uh, first part. So there'll be a variety of questions. Uh, and that way it'll give you a chance to prepare for the final exam, which final exam is going to be worth 50%. Uh, uh, it is a bigger uh component, uh, and it is going to be uh, covering mostly uh, stuff from the second half, but there will be some questions, uh, maybe about 25% of the questions uh, will come from that first uh, part of the class. So a comprehensive final exam. A couple of changes, though, from what uh, the midterm is going to be, and I'll explain how and why this is going to be the case. So this is what it says in the course outline. So this will still say, this will still, uh, we'll keep all of this information. It's comprehensive, scheduled by the registrar. You know this is going to be Monday, uh, April 15th, uh, and it's in the afternoon. Uh, so Monday, April 15th, it's in the afternoon. Uh, if you're taking it with accommodated services, you've probably already worked those things out. Um, it covers everything uh, with uh, extra emphasis on the second half. This is the only thing that's going to be different. Uh, the final exam is going to be a multiple choice exam instead of a mixed exam. Uh, now, I don't know if that's good news or bad news to you for you. Um, what I can say is that from the components that I looked at, uh, the average multiple choice component uh, was roughly equivalent to the overall average. Uh, so although it's interesting and exciting to sort of work through some of those longer answer questions, uh, the discriminability in the average would seems like it was roughly the same on the midterm. So most people did about the same on the written portion as they did on the multiple choice portion. Uh, so if you really like the written portion, uh, I apologize for uh, shifting the format. I'll tell you why I'm doing this. A couple of reasons. Number one, um, well, number one is that it may not make a difference. <laughs> it turns out that everybody did a little bit better on the multiple choice format, but roughly the same. Number two, you may or may not know this, almost nobody seems to be aware, but the teaching assistants are planning to go on strike. Uh, they're not gonna go on strike. There is a strike deadline uh, in about a, two weeks, uh, which means that if they don't negotiate a contract that they agree on, uh, that they will be in a position for a legal strike around the time that final exams begin, uh, which means that uh, final exams could uh, be disrupted. I have no idea what this is gonna mean for our class. Uh, but it would mean one thing that if we're in the middle of finals uh, and let's suppose we've taken our exam and the teaching assistant union uh, is on strike, there's significantly fewer people to mark the exam. <laughs> uh, that is, there's only me, uh, which means it would take twice as long, uh, which means it would take a lot longer to get the marks back to you. One way to deal with that is to make it a multiple choice exam, which will be marked automatically. Second, uh, should that come to pass, uh, and this is sort of, I'm not going to get into too much information, but I have a, a medical procedure the very next day, uh, which is going to require 
uh, at least a day of hospitalization and general anesthetic, and I'll be recovering for at least a week uh, from this minor surgery. So I certainly don't want to be, I won't really be in the best state to be marking written exams. Uh, so the automatic marked exams will be done by a computer and I'll get the grades and be able to post them. I want everybody to be able to have their final marks within a week, uh, which is sort of the goal. Uh, so that you should be able to get your grades back for this class uh, roughly one week after uh, the final exam or hopefully that first week. So those are the three reasons. Number one, uh, the possible labor action. Number two, the fact that I'm going to be out of commission and off for a week right after. Uh, and then number three, the fact that it in terms of overall grades, uh, it seems to be roughly equivalent. Uh, I don't can't think of any one case where the multiple choice was quite low and then the uh, written portion of the exam was higher for anyone. Uh, so we'll have multiple choice questions of the same kind uh, that were on the midterm, uh, which was still mostly multiple choice. So just imagine that without any of the uh, short answer. So I'll aim to have roughly 100 questions. Uh, so there were 60 questions on the midterm, uh, but there was also the written portion. So this will have about 100 to 110 multiple choice questions uh, with about 75% of them from the second half and about 25% for the first half. Uh, the exact numbers for each unit, I don't know exactly because I'm still sort of working through exactly which questions I'm going to choose, uh, but that's what you can expect. Uh, so are there any questions on the final exam? Excellent. So uh, that's what we'll have. <laughs> so in a few weeks, we'll have a final exam. Actually, it's just about uh, three weeks. Uh, and I'll have a little bit more to say about it next week, uh, just to remind everybody. Uh, and I'll be sending out communication on OWL to make sure everyone knows what to expect. Uh, but this is what you can expect. Multiple choice uh, from 100 to 110 multiple choice questions that cover everything in the class with a, a heavy weight from that second half since the mid. Okay, the second thing, a bit of business I wanted to cover are the course evaluations. Uh, so course evaluations, maybe you don't give much thought to this, but the university certainly does. They like to be able to track how these things, how different courses are uh, progressing, how different uh, faculty uh, perform on different metrics. Uh, and it sort of helps me as an instructor know what works and what doesn't work. Uh, so I'm gonna show just briefly a few things about the course evaluation site, just to uh, cover a few things. but. Uh, from my perspective as, a, as an instructor uh, of 21 years now, feedback is always uh, useful. Now, I've been teaching this course for uh, 21 years, uh, and the first year I taught it was extremely different <laughs> uh, from this. It had 30 students in the class the first time I ever taught this, and it was a seminar class. Uh, there was no textbook because I hadn't written it yet, uh, and uh, we had a lot of selection of readings. It was mostly discussion. There was no PowerPoint. Uh, we didn't have a lot of this kind of stuff. So a really different course. Every year I change it a little bit. So if there are things that you really liked about this class, topics that we covered, uh, ways in which we covered them, uh, that's helpful to know because I'll continue to do those things. If there's things that you didn't like, like I wish we wouldn't have had a final exam that was worth 50%, for example, you can say that. Uh, and I won't get this until the summer, uh, but it's something that's really helpful. Uh, the current format with five ex five quizzes where I drop the lowest, uh, a midterm that's worth a little less than the final, that's something that I've arrived at over the last few years based on student feedback and also on my own uh, in sort of intuitive sense of what seems to work best uh, for this class. But I always appreciate anything uh, positive, negative, uh, and constructive. I won't see them until the summer. Uh, nobody does. Uh, they're anonymized. If you said something unusually cruel to me uh, or offensive or something that wouldn't have been uh, allowed, probably, uh, the university does take a look at those before they release them. So if it was something that was like a personal attack, uh, they often remove that kind of stuff. So if you feel compelled to make personal attacks uh, towards me or any of your other, other professors, if it's really personal and hurtful, uh, it probably... Uh, there's a good chance that it may not make it back to the professor. Now, if it's negative in the sense that a uh, professor spends too much time talking about what time it's going to be and how long it's going to pay, I'll get that. Uh, it's only if it's sort of cruel and unusual and personally attacking or hurtful uh, or offensive or sexist or racist or any of those kinds of things. That gets dropped out. Uh, so what you'll do is you probably know how to do this, but let's take a quick look anyway. Um, does it remember who I am? I hope it doesn't remember my password.
Oh, okay, so I still have to have the, no, I figured it out. So a couple of things. First, let's take a look at the response rate for the class right now. Um, so, so far, it looks like 5% uh, of you have completed the course evaluations, which is fine. They were just opened up. Uh, so ideally, I'd like to get at least half of us, and I'll continue to remind you on a regular basis. Um, but the targets have not been met. Uh, we need to get at least 10% for these to even be released. Uh, so I won't even see them if you don't get above uh, 10%. So this is about where it usually is on the first week. So I'll keep an, uh, an eye on this to see if we're uh, uh, making progress. Let's take a look at some of the questions um, and how they might be useful. Is this us? No, this is how many people have completed it. Let's go back again. How do I go back? This is what I wanted to see. Let's take a quick look at some of the questions and I'll show you what I think is important. So all of these things uh, are gonna be required if I do a preview. Hold on. Where is my show preview function here? There we go. Okay, this is a preview of the task. You're gonna select what you think to get. I think I was gonna get an A, it's an optional course. Was I enthusiastic? Yes. Uh, then we go next. Um, now we're just, this is where you sort of give your basic feedback. I'm going through this by the way, because I'm the director of the undergrad program here. And one of the things we've noticed in our department is we have very low, uh, uptake on all of these things. Uh, and so I thought it might also be important, not just for this class, but for the other classes you're in, because your other professors really want to know this kind of stuff. Um, essentially, the left is good. Um, the right uh, is bad. Um, every year, I think that there are a number of students, not just in this course, but in other courses that might sometimes just mistakenly get it the other way, because naturally, I would think the right would be the high number. Right, uh, And so I can imagine that if I was like, man, I love this class, and I go and I go to the right, <laughs> strongly disagree with everything, and suddenly it looks like I have given a one-star review. Uh, so does he ex strongly agree, conducts a course in a well-organized? Well, maybe not so much. Presents the concepts clearly. And so you go through and you make your answers, right? Uh, and provides helpful feedback, motivates me to increase. Overall effective as a university instructor. Yes, Dr. Minda is effective. Uh, then it's gonna give you a chance to make two kinds of supplementary comments. This is where I think it's useful for me to know what, what, you, uh, what you liked, what you didn't like, what you think you'd like to see better. So uh, this is about supplementary comments for me. Uh, he is okay. Now this is, uh, was it a good learning experience? Yes. It was a good learning experience. Uh, supplementary comments about the course. So the first one is about the instructor. The second one is about the course itself. It was okay. Next, uh, this is the last one. You're gonna have a chance, and this is one that I think a lot of classes have, but not all of them do. Uh, you'll have a chance to sort of make some specific comments about the course itself, uh, like, the instructor's course outline, including information about tests, was clear. Was it clear? Was it not clear? So here you're selecting things about uh, how this course was organized. These are things that are really helpful to me. So not all of your classes are going to have this because these are optional. Uh, was it at a comfortable pace? Uh, were they real life situations? And then you submit. Make sure you submit. Oops, it'll tell you if you forgot to answer something. Make sure you submit uh, before you're finished. As you probably know, I think there are some $250 gift cards or something like that at random. It has nothing to do with me. This is the office of the registrar provides these things. So uh, the more times you complete a course out, uh, course evaluation, I think the more chances you get uh, to win one of these, uh, I think it's a 250, is it a $250 prize? It's something, they'll let you know when you get these emails. So take these, uh, if, if you're interested in providing feedback to me and any of your other faculty, uh, do take these seriously, um, because I certainly do, and I think probably most of your other instructors do as well. Okay, let's, um, where do I get out of this here? Whoops, I don't need that.
Any questions about course evaluations? Any questions about mid final exam or quiz? Then let's get started with what we were gonna talk about uh, today. I wanna spend just five minutes briefly highlighting these things. There are definitely questions about this on the final exam. Uh, the first were the three theories of probability. These are important because anytime we're gonna assume that we use probability in decision-making or judgment or problem solving or anything else, we wanna know where we get this probability information from. Uh, Barron, Jonathan Barron suggests there are three different ways and these are not mutually exclusive. You're probably gonna use some combination of all of them uh, when you're making estimations and judgment. Uh, the first and the most common are the frequency uh, approaches. So the frequency theory suggests uh, that when you're coming up with some estimate of how likely something is, some estimate of a probability of an event happening or not happening, you're basing it on your own observations of past frequency. Uh, so your own observations of how often you've uh, in how often you've been sick, for example, or how often you've uh, seen someone uh, texting or manipulating or utilize, using their smartphone while they're driving. Uh, so any of those kinds of things, those are frequency theories. So you make observations uh, and you those observations accumulate. This is an inductive process, relies and requires knowledge of past frequency in order to work. So you gotta have some background. The second were these logical theories, and those are the things that we spent a fair amount of time talking about, and those are things that align with classical probability theory. Uh, we need to uh, understand how likely something is. Uh, we have an estimate from our frequency theory, but with the logical theory, we might have uh, some accurate information. So exchangeable events are a really good example. Anything that's an exchangeable event, uh, the probability is gonna work the same regardless of the uh, interaction. So we suggested that maybe uh, whether it's rolling up the rim with a Tim Hortons, which you used to be able to roll them up, but apparently you need the Tim Hortons app now, which doesn't work on campus, uh, I discovered the other day. <laughs> Uh, so you can't roll up the rim anymore on campus, but you used to be able to. Those are standard exchangeable events. It doesn't matter which Tim Hortons you buy it from. Uh, it doesn't matter who's buying it. Those things stay the same. Those probabilities are known. Uh, and this works well for cards or gambling or rolling up the rim. We don't work very well with that because we rarely have that information. We're much more comfortable as humans using frequency theories or personal theories, which are based on personal knowledge beyond frequency information. So this might include some frequencies, but it might also include beliefs, and it might also include hopes and desires about the likelihood uh, of something happening. So if you think, or if you feel like this is your lucky day, that's a personal belief that may not necessarily have any grounding in frequency or logical theories. Does that seem clear to everyone? So these are three different theories, and I'll probably have some questions about each one. And the questions might be, uh, given that it's a multiple choice question, you can imagine some examples and say, uh, is this an example of, which of the following is the example of a frequency theory? And then there might be uh, four different examples and you choose the one. Or as you know, because of the way multiple choice questions are set up, it might say, which of the following is not an example of a frequency theory? And then you have to choose the one that is not. Uh, the other thing that people said they wouldn't mind hearing just a little bit more about, and uh, I did mention that I often have a question on the uh, written portion of the exam that asks you to draw the prospect theory value function. That will not be on the final exam, it turns out, because uh, there's no multiple choice version of it. Um, but I am going to ask questions about prospect theory and the value function. Uh, and the value function uh, suggests uh, sort of a hypothetical relationship between gains and losses that are objective and the subjective value that we place on them. So on this X axis, the horizontal axis, those are the objective gains and losses. Uh, so we can imagine a scenario in which you would gain $100 or lose $100. It's the same amount of money, right? You either get extra or you lose what you have. Uh, and it's the same, uh, distance. So this is the midpoint, the zero point. There's $100 plus, there's $100 minus. So that's the objective x-axis. But what prospect theory suggests is that we treat gains and losses differently. Uh, they have different prospects for us and they have different meanings for us. A gain has some subjective value uh, and a loss has a greater subjective value. In other words, 
the value or the impact that we place on the loss of $100 would be greater than the corresponding value that we would place on a gain of the same amount. It's an asymmetrical function. And this accounts for what humans show uh, quite often, which is loss aversion. One of the biggest uh, sort of central components of this uh, prospect theory is the idea that humans display both risk aversion and loss aversion. Uh, but we're particularly sensitive to loss aversion. We do not like to lose what we already have. And this value function is a way to relate that uh, sort of in a, in a, uh, in a graphic uh, way. This is not a specific person, or this isn't plotting anyone's specific data. This is a hypothetical value function showing this asymmetrical uh, gain and loss. Does that seem clear to everyone? Okay, great. Because and I'm confident that I can ask questions about this uh, on the final and everybody will understand it. Let's talk about problem solving for the rest of today, or for the rest of today and for the rest of the morning. Um, I'm gonna cover a few basics first. I'm gonna talk about the stages of problem solving. Then I'm gonna talk about the components of a problem. And then we're gonna do a few examples. Uh, in fact, this first half is gonna be a lot of different examples. Uh, we'll do one example where we ask uh, we'll show a problem solving example that we can work through online. Uh, and then I have a second problem solving example for which I will need six or seven volunteers. There's enough people here to give me seven and still have a few people uh, be able to direct. And I'll, we'll get to that in just a minute. So in terms of the stages, we've got four basic stages, but these are similar to the stages we talked about with decision making, where you kind of have to recognize that there's a problem. Uh, then you start to generate some alternatives, you choose from the alternatives, and then you evaluate. Uh, so usually what happens first uh, in any kind of problem-solving scenario, and we'll see this in all of the examples that we do, is that we have to prepare some things. Uh, we may have to recognize that we are ready to solve a problem. We have to recognize that there's a problem. Uh, so we understand that it exists. We evaluate the presence of any givens. Talk about what those are in just a minute. But essentially, you look at what you have when you need to solve a problem. If the problem is, uh, how do I get back to my building, which is the word building, with the least amount of outside walking possible? Uh, well, there's a problem, right? So the problem is I'm here, it's raining outside, and WERB is way over there, and the entire campus is not, unfortunately, connected by tunnels and walkways. Uh, so there are a variety of different ways I can choose. And I need to know what those are first, right? So I need to know the givens. Uh, what's the nearest available pedestrian tunnel? Uh, what, uh, you know, what are the ways in which I can walk through one building to the next without going outside? Uh, those, that's evaluating the present. Examine any constraints. Is one of the doors locked? Uh, or uh, is, one of the, uh, is one of the passageways blocked or something like that? And then understand, what, is is there a goose between uh, two of the buildings? Oh man, there was the worst, closest call that I think I've ever had. Uh, this is, I live in Byron, uh, which is on the Southwest uh, part of London. And there's a goose that's set up in the, uh, so, right on the sidewalk, right in the, like right along the busy Bowler Road. And there's a plaza there, there's a bank on one side, there's a pizza shop on the other side. And the goose is about two, feet, like just this far from the street, uh, right on the sidewalk. So anyone who walks by, and it's an extremely aggressive goose, I think because it's all keyed up because there's a lot of traffic going by. And I think people are going to like run into traffic because they're trying to get rid of, you know, get away from the goose. We're, my wife and I were jogging down uh, to get to the park uh, and another runner was coming back up and he said, there's a goose attacking people in front of the in front of River Park Dental. I had to punch it to get away from it, cross the street. And I'm like, thank you. Because that's what would have happened. We would have run right past it. Uh, and then, of course, we would have freaked out because it was chasing us. I probably would have jumped into traffic to get away from it. Uh, and it would have been a disaster. Uh, and many, I've seen a lot of interactions already with this. So there's a number of them on campus, too, as I'm sure you know which ones to avoid. That is a constraint. That's a problem. How do I get from, part, from where I want to go to where I want to be without interacting with any geese? And understand the eventual goal. So these are the things that we want to know. This is the preparation stage. Then there's a production stage. This is me now thinking, okay, what are all of the ways in which I can walk from this building to the next building with a minimum of outside, right? Uh, 
I can generate some potential solutions. So I'm maybe working it out in my mind. I can go this way, I can go that way. I can solve the problem in a number of different ways. Maybe some of them are better than others. Uh, I also have to bring prior knowledge to bear. So if I've done this before and it worked, I can remember that time. If I haven't done it before, or if I've only done part of it, uh, then I can use part of those things. Perhaps I've done this or I've solved this problem before, but I've done it in a not so good way. That can be a problem of its own because I might remember a solution that's not a very optimal solution and I kind of get stuck doing the same thing over and over again. So yes, I recall prior knowledge and yes, I use previous examples. And if I'm a good problem solver, those previous, previous examples will help. If I'm not a very good problem solver, those previous examples might mean that I'm stuck in a rut solving a problem in a not very effective way. Uh, the incubation stage, which doesn't always happen, but an incubation stage is when you start to solve something. We're gonna come back to this when we talk about insight. You start to solve a problem and it seems unsolvable and you just put it away. And then you come back to it and you solve it more quickly. The idea is uh, spreading activation in semantic memory can continue even if you're not actively working on solving a problem. If you're one of those people like me who likes to solve uh, Wordle and connections on a regular basis uh, or any of those sort of New York Times daily puzzle games, uh, and I still do, um, that happens sometimes, right? You start solving Wordle and you get stuck. And then you're like, okay, I'm gonna come back to it tonight. Then you come back to it tonight and you're like, oh yeah, obviously it's this. And you solve it in one or two. Uh, that's an example of an incubation process. You started to solve it and you got stuck. Uh, maybe you got in the wrong space, the wrong problem space. By leaving it for a while, some of those false starts and dead ends kind of disappear uh, while you're continuing to have some residual spreading activation. So when you come back to the problem, the uh, false starts and those uh, dead ends are no longer uh, active, but what seems to be active is maybe the correct uh, solution after all. We'll talk more about this when we talk about insight problem solving. Then at the end, uh, we're going to make some uh, judgments and some evaluations. Essentially, we have to try to solve the problem. You can't work this all out in your head ahead of time, but you can get pretty far. But eventually, you have to actually make a commitment. I'm going to solve the problem in this way. Uh, maybe uh, you're going to stop and give up. Uh, maybe you're going to persist. Uh, maybe you're going to come back to it later and allow some incubation. So this is not a linear process. You know that you have to solve a problem. You get the stage set. You evaluate constraints. You work on solving it. Maybe you don't solve it. You let some incubation happen. You come back to it. Maybe you come back to it again. Uh, and so this is a process that might uh, work uh, back and forth several times until you settle on a solution. So we introduced some of these terms. And these are terms that I usually ask questions about on an exam. So we're going to divide a problem up into five different components. Oh, so five different things that make a situation a problem and not just a behavior. Five different things that make the behaviors that you're going to choose part of problem solving and not just stimulus response, not just doing the first thing that comes to mind. And these are the initial state, the obstacles, the goals, the givens, and the means. The problem itself is defined here uh, with this gap or barrier or this obstacle. So if the thing that you want to acquire uh, is not immediately apparent how you should acquire it, uh, or if the behaviors that you're planning to execute uh, don't immediately have the outcome that you expect, uh, and there's something intervening, and you don't exactly know what that thing is, or you don't exactly know how to get past it, then you have a problem. Uh, a series of behaviors isn't necessarily a problem, but a series of behaviors in which it's not clear how to get from where you are to where you want to get, that's when you have a problem. So the problem is a gap or a barrier between the current state, where I am now and where I wanna get. Uh, so today, the problem is, how do I get back to my office without getting wet? So for these, at the initial state, we also have what we're gonna call givens. And that's just what is given to you when you need to start solving a problem. What are the things you have at your disposal? Uh, what are the things that are uh, present in the environment that could help or hurt your ability to solve the problem? Um, these are objects, conditions, and constraints. Some of these things might be obvious. Some of these things might be not obvious. 
or some of them may not be known yet. They could be known or unknown. They can be explicit or implicit. Uh, and one of the examples I use in the textbook are some of those food TV or food network competitive cooking games, whether it's a baking challenge or uh, one of these Guy Fieri uh, grocery games or Chopped or any of these kind of shows that I'm sure you've seen where there's nothing else on and you're on vacation or you're in a hotel and it's food TV on and you're watching people uh, try to create some uh, dish out of mystery ingredients. It's a good example of problem solving because most people know how to cook. In, on these shows, they know how to combine ingredients, but they don't know what the ingredients are. As soon as they're revealed, now they have some givens. And some of those things are the actual ingredients. Some of those things might be the cookware that they have, but other things might be personal to the person who's trying to solve the problem, like their experience with that ingredient or their uh, familiarity with a certain technique uh, that might work or might not work. Uh, and so all of those things are present at the beginning. Uh, these are given, some of them help, some of them hurt. If you're not familiar with a particular ingredient, then that's a constraint, right? You don't know how to work with that ingredient. You know how to peel it. You know how to properly cut it. Uh, that might be a constraint. Uh, a given that is helpful might be something like uh, having worked with a particular ingredient for most of your professional cooking career. Lots of givens can be explicit. Uh, givens might also be implicit. You're not aware of them yet until you get a little further uh, into the problem-solving uh, experience. The obstacles themselves are all of the things you might imagine would interfere with your ability to get anything you want, uh, which is you don't know how to solve the problem because you don't remember solving it. You've never solved it before, so you have no immediate recall. Uh, maybe there's no clear path. And by path, I'm gonna talk later about cognitive paths. So a problem space approach that's kind of analogous to a physical space. Uh, but when I use the physical example of me walking to my office, uh, maybe there is no clear path. Uh, there isn't one direct way from the 3M center to WERB that allows me to walk completely inside uh, without getting wet. So there's no clear path. So I've got some problems to solve. Maybe it's an unfamiliar domain. Uh, if it's your first year on campus and you're trying to solve the problem of how do I get from the 3M center uh, to WERB without getting wet, you're probably not gonna do it as well uh, as if you've been on campus for maybe a longer amount of time. So an unfamiliar domain, you don't have as much experience. And there are a lot of cognitive limitations. Maybe you're just busy doing something else. Maybe you're working on another problem. Maybe you're trying to uh, have a conversation with somebody, uh, or maybe you have, maybe you're tired because you were up all night and your ability to solve problems is gonna be reduced. Maybe you're in a good mood uh, and your problems uh, are easier to solve because you can express or show a little bit more cognitive flexibility. Maybe you're in a negative mood, and so your attentional focus is narrowed, as we suggested a negative mood might do, uh, which makes it harder uh, to explore different uh, solution paths. Uh, another part of the problem are the means, and this was one of those other arrows that was pointing up. The means are all of the legal ways to solve a problem. When I say legal, I just mean things that are possible for you to do within that scenario. If we're studying, because what we'll see in a few slides is that problem solving is often studied in domains like games or chess uh, or uh, problems that are set up that have some specific things that you can do and you can't do. And those might be the moves or the uh, actions or the behaviors that are permitted in that particular problem. For real world problem solving uh, scenarios, things, you know, one of the problems you're trying to solve is how can I afford rent next month? Uh, probably something that many people think about. There are things you can do, uh, which is maybe you can reduce your spending a little bit or uh, make sure that you have enough shifts uh, at work. Those are things that are acceptable. Stealing a car. Uh, is not acceptable. It is a way to solve the problem, uh, but it wouldn't be the preferred way. So it might be just like trying to cheat in a game uh, if you're trying to steal a car uh, and then make extra money that way. Obviously not the best way to go forward uh, trying to uh, make a rent payment. So things that these are operations that change the original state so that you can move closer to the goal state. 
And it's going to be uh, cognitive operations, like trying to remember things and making sure you apply your attention and have the appropriate working memory. And for some problems, it's going to involve physical or real world operations, changes in your investments or changes in the way in which you're going to move or changes in the way you're going to uh, move a piece or move another person or move an object, uh, changes in the way you might uh, 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 you know, select a driving route or something like that. So all of these are the things that you can do to take where you are now and get a little bit closer to what you want to get. And the goal state is what you would like to attain, whether it's a good dinner, uh, relatively dry uh, route from your current building to the next building you need to be, uh, or a good mark in this class. Those are things that you want to attain. So at the beginning of this course, you started off with no grades. Uh, and at the end of this course, you would like to end up with something, let's say an 85. Uh, that's a goal. You don't know how to get there yet at the beginning of the class, but you do know ways to get there. You can study. Uh, you can read ahead of time. You can come to class. All of those things are ways or means in which you can solve the problem of how do I excel in this class? Does that seem straightforward to everyone? So let's identify the parts of this problem and then let's solve this together, shall we? Um, this is on a website called Math is Fun. This is a very low tech website, as you'll see. It's like uh, a website from 30 years ago. But um, what we're gonna do is solve this problem and let's identify the parts now and as we're solving it. And then when we're finished, we'll come back and identify the problems again. Um, so you have a three liter and a five liter jug. Uh, one of them is the five liter jug. One of them is the three liter jug that you can fill from a fountain. And the problem is to fill exactly, fill one of the jugs with exactly four liters of water. How do you do it? So let's identify some of the parts. First of all, uh, the problem is we don't have a four liter jug, right? So if we need four liters of water, uh, there's no immediate solution. So that's what makes this a problem. Here is our, end, our initial state. Our initial state is some water and a lot of empty jugs. And our goal state is we need four liters of water, but there's no immediate way to get there. What are some of the givens in this? What are the things that are uh, make it easier or harder to solve this problem? So what are the things that you have given to you at the initial state uh, that can help or hurt? Source of water. So you got a source of water. That is a given. Uh, so one given, uh, if you had no source of water, this would be an impossible problem, right? Uh, so you have a given there. What's another given? Maybe one that's not, yeah. You've got two containers. So you have two containers to work with and you know the volumes of those two containers. They're a problem, but at least you know them. Any other givens that come to mind? And there's some more implicit ones. Rain. That run of water. There's a drain. So there's a place where we can put the water, which then implies a second uh, given that might not be stated. Uh, in fact, it's a, it's a given that isn't stated. Uh, this one isn't stated, but you see it. So you know you can pour the water out. Another given uh, that might not be immediately stated is that you can fill, which it says it's given. Uh, but another implicit given is that you can empty. Uh, so not only can we fill jugs, but we can empty jugs. So that may end up being part of the problem even though, though it's not immediately stated. Let's take a look at this and see if it works first. Jugs puzzle game, math is fun. We want to fill four from five and three and let's play. Now, someone tell me what's the first move that I should make? What should I, what would you do first in this case? I've completely forgotten how to solve it. But can anybody give me a starting move? What would be the first means? Fill the five liter one completely. Let's fill the five liter one. Math is fun. Holy cow, this is great. I'm having so much fun. Now, what should I do? Um, pour into the three liter one and then dump. All right. And then which do I dump? Dump the three liter one. Dump the three liter one, okay. Now what have I got? Two. <laughs> um, and then the five liter one. And I think we're back to square one. 
All right, so we're, we're, we're back here where we started. That was a false start. So what's another suggestion? That was a good intuition. We got to dump one of them out. Which one did we say we had to, we, we had to do this? And we dumped this one out, right? Suppose we dump this one out. Now what could I do? Pour the three liter one into the five liter one. I can do that. Anybody know what I should do next? Um, fill up the three liter again and then dump that into the no, then the three into the five. And then you're left with one. Okay. Dump, hold on, dump the five out. Yeah, dump the five out and then put, dump the one in and then fill the three and then dump that in. You did it in 13 moves, yay. Now there are a number of ways to solve this. Um, so one of the, let's, let, well, I'm going to move back to the slide there. Where we can start identifying some of these problems. There are several ways to solve this problem. Now we took perhaps maybe a more circuitous route, uh, which is we had a couple of false starts. We started off at the beginning several times. Um, there are faster ways to solve it. Um, I think if I can remember how to do this, let's play again. I think Let's try this. If I fill five, I'm trying to remember, I looked at this this morning to make sure I could do the fastest solution. There's a 0% chance I'm gonna remember how to do it. Um, I think I need to do this. And then what I think I need to do is um, dump this one out. Or well, didn't we do that the last time? I think I need to fill this one up again. Wait a minute. I think I dumped this out. Then I think I put this in here. Then I think I fill this up. Uh, and then I think what I do, oh man, I there's no way I can remember how to do this again. All right, I'm gonna have to go back to my uh, solution here. Oh wait, I think I've almost got it. I fill that up there. No, I lost it again. There is a problem, there is a solution, <laughs> but I've forgotten it now. The solution was supposed to be we fill up that big jug. We fill up the three from the five, which we said we did, right? Um, now we've got two and three. Then we pour out the three gallon jug, leaving the two left in the five gallon jug. And I think we were at that stage, right? Um, and this is the trick that I think most of us, including me, having just looked at it this morning, can never get, which is we transfer from the five to the three. So we start here with a two and then we just move the two over. Then we've got a two and a five. And then this is the fastest way to solve the problem that most people don't get. And the reason is that it runs counter to the explanation. We take the five and the two, and then we dump the five in, filling this up just one more liter, and we're left with four. The fastest way to solve this problem, which I thought I was going to impress everyone with by just solving it in five moves, but I even failed. Um, the fastest way to solve the problem is to empty so that you are left with four. And the problem is stated in such a way, can you fill a jug? Can you fill the jug so that you only have four liters? It doesn't say, can you arrange the jug so that when you empty one of them, you have four liters left? And that seems to be the sticking point for me uh, and for most people uh, in a problem like this. So did everybody get the idea? We're gonna fill the five liter jug. Let's start this over again. And we dump, right? Then let me go back to my guideline here. I pour out the pour out the three and then I switch. So I pour out this three. And this is the step that all of us, me included, missed. Uh, now I fill this up again. And here's the magic moment where you pour it out. You did it in six moves. Uh, and that's the trick. And we're going to see this in a lot of other examples, that problems can be difficult to solve if they are represented in one way. This is represented and interpreted by most of us as a filling problem, but it's actually an emptying problem. The problem is, how do I have my water jug situated in such a way that I can be left 
with four. So it's taking away, it's a subtraction problem and not an addition problem, but it's framed or worded or represented by us primarily as, let's uh, get back out of this. It's represented primarily uh, as, a, as an addition problem to fill, right? Uh, it doesn't say you can't do it that way. So that's an example of an implicit uh, given. You can always empty, right? We, ne we mentioned that, that there is a drain. One of you mentioned there was a drain and that we could empty stuff out, but it's still framed as an addition problem, right? That you're trying to fill these jugs and not empty them. So the fastest way to solve this problem is to represent it in a different way, to choose a different representation, to choose a representation of subtraction rather than addition. The problems with most problems, and this is what we're going to get to for the next 20 minutes or so, uh, is the way they're represented. The way in which the reason most problems are problems is that we've construed the world or represented the world in one way, and it doesn't give us an immediate solution. Uh, if we can represent things in a different way, the problem can often be easier to solve. So we're going to go through a bunch of examples about how this works. Uh, here's an example that's in the textbook. So this is not for us to solve. I'm just going to work through this. Um, but uh, Richard Posner, uh, in uh, one of the earliest textbooks on cognitive psychology, uh, had a section on problem representation. And this is a really good example. And the example highlights the importance of representation. Uh, most of us when we solve simple problems, they're represented in the right way. They're represented in a way that makes sense to us. But when it seems difficult or when we have a challenge, it's because we're thinking about things in the wrong way. Maybe we're thinking about them uh, with a different frame, just like we were with the water jug problem. And I even knew that one and I still couldn't get it. Uh, so here's Posner's problem. It's called the birds and trains problem. There are two train stations are 50 miles apart. At 2 p.m. one Saturday afternoon, two trains start towards each other, one from each station. Just as the train pulls out of the station, a bird springs into the air in front of the first train and flies ahead to the second train, okay? So you got a train in uh, Toronto, a train in London, they head towards each other. The Toronto bird uh, flies ahead to meet the London train, which is coming towards it, right? Uh, and flies ahead to the second train. When the bird reaches the second train, it turns back and flies towards the first train. The bird continues to do this until the two trains meet. If both trains travel at the rate of 25 miles an hour, and the bird flies at 100 miles an hour, how many miles will the bird have flown before the trains meet? So this is one of those kind of problems you can imagine being given on some sort of high school level math class uh, that just is, causes people to say, no, math is not fun. <laughs> uh, math is unfun. Uh, math is fun. It just doesn't seem fun when you're being graded on your ability to solve a word problem like this, which is obviously trying to confuse you. Uh, so let's look at some of the parts of this problem. This is the actual problem. How many miles will the bird have flown? That's all we need to know. How many miles will the bird have flown? And so the natural representation is one focused on the bird, right? Because that's the thing that you're trying to solve. You know you got two trains. The, you know they start at 2 p.m. They start towards each other, one from each station, one in Toronto, one in London. They're going towards each other. As they pull out of the station, the bird in Toronto flies towards London, comes to the London train, which is driving towards it. So it's not going the whole way to London. It's going to London, but London minus whatever the train has already traveled. Then it goes back, but now the Toronto train has moved. So it's going to start flying smaller distances. That seems like a really hard problem to solve because you don't know how, um, you don't know how much distance there is. You're trying to figure out how much distance there is. And what Posner suggests is that the way the problem is framed encourages us to build a representation around the bird, because that's what we're trying to solve for. If this is a mathematics equation or a calculus uh, equation, you're trying to solve for a variable, right? What you're trying to solve for is the number of miles the bird has solved. And it can be really difficult because you're trying to add up these lines. You don't really know. Um, it's really hard to work this out, right? You could work it out by saying 50 miles, 25 miles an hour, it's moved this, the bird moves 100 miles an hour, but as it moves, uh, towards, as it moves from here to this, uh, this one has moved exactly uh, four miles by the time it gets here. And so you could do it. It just wouldn't be very easy, right? You have to do each one of these little differential equations and then uh, find the total amount of distance that it's solved. So not difficult, not impossible, but nearly impossible uh, for people to solve 
uh, without some uh, additional computational aids. What Posner suggests is that the problem could be re-represented as a trains problem and not a bird problem. If it's a trains problem, uh, it's very easy to solve without any additional computational aids. Why? Uh, because uh, the trains stations are 50 miles apart. The trains travel at 25 miles an hour, which is half of 50. So in one hour, they will meet, right? They have to, by definition, if they're 50 miles apart and they travel 25 miles an hour towards each other, they will meet in one hour. We also know that the bird flies 100 miles an hour, which means that the blown bird has flown how many miles? 100. 100 miles. I mean, it doesn't matter how many back and forths. And this is the challenge. By focusing on the bird, we're thinking about all the back and forths, but it doesn't matter. If we focus on the bird trains and the time, all we need to know is the bird has been flying continuously for one hour. If the bird flies 100 miles an hour, then it's flown 100 miles because it's been flying for one hour. Uh, Posner's suggestion is that the reason problems can be really difficult for some of us, one when problems seem difficult, it's because we've represented the problem in a wrong way. Uh, this is a theme you've probably identified from lots of other aspects of this class. Uh, decisions can be framed in a way that makes them difficult uh, to solve. Logic problems can be framed or uh, written in such a way that makes them believable or non-believable, which changes your ability uh, to determine whether or not they're valid. Uh, so one of the things that seems to be a common thread for a lot of these classes or a lot of these topics is that the way in which we've constructed a representation of the world can either help us or stand in the way of getting what we want. And in this case, uh, Posner's suggesting that this might stand in the way of solving the problem. One of the reasons this mechanism works or this uh, representation problem uh, seems to work uh, comes from some research that Newell and Simon started. Uh, in the 1970s. So we're going to come back to some of Simon's work in the second half when we talk about insight and creativity. Uh, Simon's work, and Newell and Simon's work, were some of the pioneers of artificial intelligence uh, work uh, in the late 1960s and early 1970s. So a lot of what we uh, know about artificial intelligence comes from, it's sort of built on the foundations of work that they've done. Uh, one of the things that they were interested in doing was coming up with ways to understand how to build a system, a computer system, uh, a digital problem solving system that would solve problems in a way that's comparable to how humans solve problems. Humans and computers can solve problems, but in really different ways. Humans solve problems by taking as many shortcuts as possible and by using their own knowledge as much as possible. Uh, the same way we do with everything else. We use heuristics and we use our knowledge to do things. And usually that helps, but sometimes it's the wrong solution. Sometimes it helps us get a solution really quickly. Sometimes it helps us, but it hurts us or constrains us from ever solving the problem because we represented something in the wrong way. So in order to design a computer system, Newell and Simon started a, an investigation of human problem solving. How do humans solve problems? Can we use some insights there from psychology to understand how to make computer systems better? And one of the things they found was that Humans tend uh, to solve problems, uh, and one way to sort of bring human and computer problem solving together is to define it as a problem space. The problem space would be all of the possible solutions and representations. So in the bird and train example, the problem space is all of the possible ways you could represent that problem and solve it. Uh, one solution or one navigation through problem space is the trying to add up all the back and forth lines. Another problem space, one that's a smaller problem space, is just focusing on the trains and the time. Uh, both of those are problem spaces. One is really big because you got to drive back and you got to follow the bird back and forth. One is really small uh, because you have only one possible solution. And so they suggested that when we solve problems, we're searching through the space of all of the possible solutions in order to find the fastest. Now the sort of the analogy is a physical map, uh, like the problem I started with, which is how do I get from here to Werb without getting wet? Uh, that's a physical problem space, but there are cognitive problem spaces where we have lots of possible solutions and we represent all of those solutions and we search through all of those solutions to find the one uh, that's the most appropriate. 
This might be a step-by-step -step process where you're searching for something. If I do this, will it result in this outcome? If I do this, will it result in a different outcome? The problem of problem representation is to find, to represent a problem in a way that has a relatively small and constrained problem space. And furthermore, to be able to rule out areas of that problem space so you don't need to search through them. But again, the problem space is all of the possible solution paths that connect the initial state to the goal state. We want to solve problems well, efficiently, and quickly, we want a small space. Um, for any kind of complex problems, there are probably too many paths to evaluate. Not true for a computer or an artificial intelligence uh, system. So many computer solving, problem solving algorithms can look at lots of solution, potential solutions in parallel simultaneously, right? So there are lots of ways to solve a problem. A computer can do things really quickly. We can't. Uh, so we have to choose the solutions that seem the most appropriate by using our knowledge and heuristics. So most of us solve problems by choosing the area of problem space we're most familiar with, or the area of problem space that seems to be the most uh, appealing, or the area of problem space that makes the most sense, or the area of problem space that we've been in before. Uh, so we use our knowledge uh, and some general heuristics to be able to come up with a solution. So I want to talk about two kinds of heuristics. The kind of heuristics that we're most familiar with for decision-making and judgment have to do with uh, things like availability and representativeness and those kinds of memory-based heuristics where we say, does this remind me of something? And then we choose a solution based on what it reminds me of. Newell and Simon also identified what they call some general problem-solving heuristics. And these are strategies that most people use when they don't know exactly what the solution should be. Uh, so these are strategies that we might use to shrink the problem space if we don't have a memory. So two kinds of heuristics, the kind of heuristic that base, that's based on memory and a heuristic that is a strategy or a shortcut that helps us restrict the number of possible solution paths. So let's talk about both of these. Your algorithm uh, in problem solving, so let's make a distinction between algorithmic and heuristic problem solving. An algorithm in, in problem solving uh, tends to be something that is guaranteed to find the correct answer, uh, but may take a long time. This could be something like uh, a recipe or a step-by-step -step guide to solve the problem. Uh, this could be something that requires many steps. If we were using, for example, the water jug problem, and we had no idea how to do anything, and we weren't feeling particularly clever, and we really wanted to guarantee that we solved the problem in the fewest number of moves, we might choose every possible configuration. We would solve the problem in every possible way first, uh, the 13 move version, the 10 move version, until we determined that this sequence of moves is the fastest. And that would be our solution. That would search through all of the possible solution spaces, all of the possible steps that could take you there, uh, and then choose the one that is the fastest. That's an algorithmic approach to problem solving, where you look at everything, and then you choose the best, most efficient, and fastest way to get there. Like a math formula or a recipe. And a heuristic relies on knowledge. It's not always guaranteed, uh, but usually... Uh, you use your general knowledge, what you're familiar with, and you can arrive at a good approximation. So let's talk about some of these algorithms and heuristics. We'll start with the algorithmic example of problem space, and then we'll talk about all of these. Uh, these will take a little bit longer, but these will be relatively quick. So uh, by the time we get to the end of this, we're gonna talk briefly about insight, and I think we'll probably be taking a break roughly around 1050. That's my goal. Um, I'm going to see if I can solve that problem uh, by not getting too distracted. Actually, it's probably not going to happen. It's probably going to be closer to 11. Let's just say 11 o'clock. Uh, so exhaustive search. This is the worst possible way to solve a problem if you're unfamiliar with it. This would be like using all of the possible moves in the water jug problem and then deciding which one is the fastest. You've already solved every possible configuration, and now you just say, okay, that was it. That was the fastest way. Now, this could be... and. So that means you, you use, you're investigating the entire problem space or as much of the problem space as is necessary until you find a solution. Uh, this could be a really good uh, solution sometimes. In the textbook, I describe the example of, you know, when my two 
uh, daughters were a lot younger. And you probably remember this when you were in like grade four or something. Uh, did you ever like leave the house and not know where your jacket was or your school bag was on a regular basis, right? And your parents would say, uh, get your jacket. I don't remember where it is. Have you ever, did you ever look at the lost and found at your elementary at the end of the year? There are more jackets in there than there were students. I don't know how it got so big. Uh, there were these huge bins of hoodies and sweatshirts and jackets, coats and bags. And I was like, where did all this, do kids just leave it there and never never get it again? And then they just come with a new coat. So apparently that's what kids do. They don't know where they leave their coats. But if you're ready to leave the house and your mom or dad says, go get your jacket. I don't know where it is. Go look for it. Where would you look? You would look at every place in the house, right? You would start in your room uh, and then you would just sort of work around exhaustively until you find it. So an exhaustive search is one that assumes that you're searching everywhere, every possible location. In problem solving, that might mean that you're investigating all of the possible solutions before you decide which one that you're gonna use. All of the possible solution paths before you pick the shortest one. You're looking for a lost toy. You're looking for your lost Airbot, AirPods Pro or your lost jacket. Not a bad solution if the space is small. If you only have one room uh, and it's the only place you could have left your AirPods, then it's not a difficult uh, search space. Right? It's not a bad solution. But for any uh, sort of complex game that might uh, mean that you're possibly looking at millions of possible solution paths, it's not an appropriate strategy. So we need to narrow the solution path. And you see this even if you're searching for a lost jacket, you use heuristics first, right? If you're looking for your phone or your keys or your wallet or your AirPods or your jacket, you go to places where you think you would have left them. Uh, like the uh, gentleman who lost his, uh, his uh, iPad, iPad or whatever it was. Remember the guy here who was looking for his iPad? He went back to a classroom where he had just been. He didn't search every classroom in the university. He searched a classroom where he had been. So he's already using some knowledge. Uh, an exhaustive search would have meant, I'll look everywhere, every space, every tiny, you know, every square foot of the university to find my AirPod, AirPad. I keep saying it, iPad. Um, instead, he used some knowledge to narrow the search space to this classroom. Uh, at which point he was able to find it. So it's good, but it's not always good. We need to use knowledge. Uh, but what if we're not familiar with the domain? What if we are only somewhat familiar with the domain? Uh, then we might employ some of these general problem-solving strategies that Newell and Simon uh, identified. And again, I'll point to the, I, I'm pointing to the seat where the guy was sitting. He's not here anymore. But when I point to here, you know who I'm talking about, right? Uh, the iPad guy. Uh, so iPad guy, didn't use an exhaustive search. He used some memory uh, and a heuristic to uh, get himself in the appropriate area, which was here. Then perhaps maybe he could have used something like a hill climbing strategy. A hill climbing strategy is where uh, you evaluate you know, behaviors or moves in a problem solving scenario in such a way that you only do something that's gonna meet, bring you closer to your goal. You don't consider things that would take you away from your goal. So in a hill climbing example, um, if you are the guy here uh, and you think it's in this room, you might then only look at places that are uh, likely to actually get you closer to finding your, iP your, I your, your iPad, which is you might look at the space around you right? Uh, and then you might look a little bit further away. So you think if it's not here, maybe it's just a little bit further. Maybe it's just a little bit further. A non-hill climbing strategy would be, I look here, and then maybe I go outside and look outside, then I come back. And so it's a less structured uh, search scenario. There are some downsides to hill climbing, and hill climbing often can put you in a place where you're trying to solve a problem, but if you're in a problem that requires you to temporarily move away from something, uh, hill climbing doesn't work. Hill climbing strategy suggests that you're only doing something if it brings you closer to the solution. If it's something that brings you further from the solution temporarily, uh, it might be something that doesn't seem like the right approach. What does that mean in practice? Let me give you a couple of examples. But one example might mean uh, if you were uh, investing in something, 
So suppose you have a series of investments and suppose you're one of these people uh, who likes to invest in something that's kind of volatile, right? And your people keep telling you to hold, right? Uh, until the value of this particular uh, meme stock gets to a certain level. But suppose it starts to go down. Now that's where the tension arises, right? You don't want to have loss. So you're tempted to sell the stock now. Uh, but other people might suggest don't sell it because eventually it's going to go back up, right? That's hill climbing. If you're trying to just get to a certain point and then cash in, fine. But if you're trying to get higher than that, you may have to weather some downturn. A hill climbing strategy would be hard there because it would make it feel as if you're investing in something that's losing money. You're spending time in the wrong direction. If you're only climbing a hill like this poorly constructed uh, robot that can only do one thing. Uh, so this is my hill climbing example. This is the robot that we want to climb to the top of a mountain in Mars, right? But we only gave it one instruction, unfortunately, uh, after spending billions of dollars to get this robot to Mars, we told it, we want you to climb to the top of the highest mountain on Mars, and we'll give you one set of instructions, which is only go forward if it will not mean that you are going down. So only take a step forward if you can stay the same or increase in altitude. So this robot says, okay, in order to get to the top of the peak, I just need to keep going up. If I take a step forward, it has to be either a step up or a step on the level, right? So I can keep moving forward as long as I'm not going down. Uh, and he gets here and he's like, I've made it, but he hasn't. Uh, the robot has not made it to the top of the mountain. The robot has made it to a local maxima in this case. In other words, it's a false peak. Uh, this robot with its hill climbing instruction uh, thinks that it's solved the problem. This is you thinking that you've invested in the meme stock enough to be able to make a lot of money. But in fact, the meme stock is going to go down for a while, but then the real peak is here. The winners sell here, right? Because now it's just going to keep declining. Um, I do not invest in any meme stocks. I promise you, I have no, I am not going to provide that investment advice for you to invest in meme stocks. Uh, that's, you're on your own for that. Um, so that's the problem with the hill climbing strategy. It can work to narrow the search space. It can put you in the right direction. Uh, and it's a pretty good way to get somewhere if you're not sure where to go. I mean, that makes sense, right? If you want to get somewhere, one way to get there is to only take steps if you're going in that direction. Uh, but if there's an obstacle and the obstacle requires you to backtrack or to unsolve the problem for a little while, uh, then it can be a challenge. That's where the solution of me the strategy of means end analysis seems much more appropriate. And this is probably something that even if you didn't have a name for it, you've probably solved problems like this before. The basis of means end problem solving is that you break a very complex problem up into small solvable subproblems. Each one of these smaller problems can be solved either from memory or from a simple strategy like hill climbing. So this would be saying, what's the real goal? I don't think I can get there, but I can get to these smaller goals. You know, most of us do this in long-term problem solving. If your goal uh, is to graduate with an honors degree in psychology, uh, there's no immediate path there, right? I mean, there's lots of things that can intervene. So you, sell, you have smaller goals. My first goal is to uh, enter into the program in psychology and get through introduction to psychology and data science 1000 uh, and statistics uh, 21, uh, 2801 or whatever the stats class is. So your first goals are just to get through those classes, right? Uh, then your goal might be to get into the honors program. And then you have other things that keep you in there. So those are sub goals. And each one of those have sub sub goals, which is just get above a 75 or just get an 80 in this particular class, which has sub goals itself, which might mean getting a certain mark on each assignment. So you break up your big goal, which is get an honors degree in psychology into goals as small as I need to study for this quiz tonight. Uh, and so you're solving those small problems helps you solve the bigger problem. So it requires taking a bigger view. Best example, we're going to do two examples here. We'll do one really straightforward example. And then the next example is where we'll need some volunteers. Uh, the tower problem is one that most people have probably solved uh, even without realizing it. And this is a really simple problem. And there are lots of other problems that are built on top of this. Uh, if you've ever played that game, it's called like traffic jam or something. Uh, or if you've ever played those uh, sort of tile games, you know, where you have to make a 
a certain picture and then it's all scrambled and you have to move the tiles around. Um, or a Rubik's cube where you're trying to solve the Rubik's cube and you got one uh, side solved, but then you have to unscramble that. You have to scramble that side again in order to get the next two, right? Uh, all of these have something in common, which is you may have to solve part of something and then you have to unsolve it for a while in order to solve the larger problem. Tower problem breaks this down into a short number of steps. Uh, here is your initial state. Your initial state is I've got some disks uh, built on top of this peg here. This is a little tiny tower. Uh, and this little tower here with three disks and three pegs uh, has an initial state and a goal state uh, where we want to be able to put all of the uh, disks in the same configuration on the rightmost peg. So initial state tower is here, uh, goal state tower is on the right-hand side. There are a couple of constraints or givens in this case. Constraint number one is that you can only move one disk at a time. Otherwise, we would just take the whole stack, pick it up, and move it over. So we can only move one disk at a time. Constraint number two is that you can never have a big disk on top of a small disk. Uh, so you can only have smaller disks on top of larger disks. So if there's more than one disk on a peg, it has to be in size order. Otherwise, the tower is unstable. So with those two rules, most people can solve this problem really easily. It gets more complex if you have more disks and if you have more pegs. Um, but what most people realize early on is that there are some sub-goals. The ultimate goal is this. But given these constraints with you can only move one disk at a time and that you have to have a bigger disk uh, on the bottom, you can never have a bigger disk on top of a smaller disk, one of the first sub-goals we have to figure out is, well, we need to have a foundation disk over here. In other words, we need to have a... Uh, we need to work it so that we can get the large disk on the rightmost peg. In other words, we've got to build the foundation. In order to build the foundation, that opens up another sub-goal, which is we need to clear off that bigger disk, which then opens up another sub-goal, uh, which is we need to uh, clear off this bigger disk, but then in order to do that, we need to then move this disk back to clear off the peg. So you've got several sub-goals. Sub-goal number one, clear off the disk. Sub-goal number two, we have to uh, clear off the peg. Uh, then we can finally move this, at which case this guy moves over here, this guy moves over here, and then it moves uh, over in that direction. Uh, the reason hill climbing doesn't work here is that you find yourself moving disks from the peg that they're supposed to be away from the goal. So if you've moved this little disk here, that's eventually where you want it to be. So if you're just trying to move things towards the goal, uh, you're gonna have to move it back. So you've already moved this little disk where it needs to be. Now you've got to move it here, but now you've got a sub-sub goal, which is you've moved this, and now you need to clear off the second one, which means moving the small disk backwards to its original starting place in order to rebuild the tower uh, at the end. So there are several stages in this problem where working, uh, you, see, you need to work backwards just a little bit. Another, uh, maybe even a better example, uh, is the so-called hobbits and orcs problem. Now, this is where I'm going to need some volunteers. Uh, for volunteers for this one, I need to have three people who would volunteer to be hobbits in this case. Uh, it doesn't matter because, thankfully, I have signs for you to hold. Uh, so three of you will hold... I would like seven people, if possible, to come. Can seven people come up? Actually, yes. Can we get seven people to come up? Don't all run up at once. Um, and then we'll assign you to hobbits and orcs. And then one of you lucky people, the luckiest one of all gets to be the boat. Uh, so if you really feel keen on being the boat, uh, we're going to assign you as hobbit. Are you okay with the hobbits? Hobbit, 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 okay. Orc, orc. One more orc, and I need a boat. Because I'm just going to direct the show here. I don't want to be the boat. All right, you are the boat. Um, okay, so everybody on this side for now. So let's have a boat to the far right. Boat, you stand in the middle. Um, let's have everybody on this screen here. And boat, you can stand right here in the middle. This is the river right here between the two screens. So this is the river that we need to cross. Everybody's on this. There's our hobbits, there's our orcs. 
and we're going to get everybody over here. So we need to move everyone from here to here, and you're the boat in the middle. So they're going to, you don't actually have to push the boat, uh, but we want the orcs and the hobbits to travel with the boat. So you're going to be traveling back and forth. We're going to try to move everybody over there. Let's read the problem out together, shall we? And then you out there who have not volunteered, you will direct the action. Uh, you will tell which hobbit and which orc to get in the boat. That's you. Uh, take the boat over to the other side, and then one of them has to bring the boat back and so on. So how many of you are familiar with the uh, Lord of the Rings uh, trilogy, uh, movies of any kind, or the stories, or in general, just the whole idea of Middle Earth? So you can sort of imagine uh, the scenario. We've got three hobbits and three orcs. Uh, they arrive at a riverbank, which is right here where the boat is. Uh, and they all wish to cross to the other side. Right now, we're in a stage where hobbits and orcs, although they're antagonistic, they just happen to be going in the same direction right now. They're not in the middle of a battle. Um, fortunately, there is a boat. That's you. Thank you. Um, but unfortunately, the boat can only hold two creatures at a time. So only two of you can travel in the boat at one time. Uh, there's another problem. Orcs are vicious. Vicious creatures. Whenever there are more orcs than hobbits on one side of the river, the orcs will immediately attack the hobbits and eat them up. So we have to maintain a balance. If the orcs outnumber the hobbits, so if we have a stage where there's three orcs, one hobbit, game is over, hobbit's dead. Um, orcs will immediately attack the hobbits and eat them. Consequently, you should be certain that you never leave more orcs than hobbits on any river bank. Note that orcs, though vicious, can be trusted to bring the boat back across the river. How should the problem of ferrying everyone across the river be solved? So we need to get all six of these creatures from this side to this side using a boat that only can carry two people and the orcs can never outnumber the hobbits at any stage. Got it? Okay, so what is move number one? Who would like to, who should we send over in uh, the boat first? Orc, one of the orcs. One orc? Or two orcs. Oh, so it's two. We can send two because somebody's got to bring it back. So if we only send one orc, it's just going to be the same orc. So let's send two orcs. Two orcs go over in the boat, push over with the boat. Um, okay, so there's two orcs. So that means one of you orcs gets out. So one orc can go further over to the side there. So you're going to stay out in the boat and we're going to send an orc back. Okay. Now we're on the other side of the river. Uh, orc, orc, hobbit, hobbit, hobbit. We're okay balance wise. Who goes next? What should we do next in this case? If we send a hobbit and an orc, we're going to have two hobbits and one orc on this side. But when we get over there, we're going to have problems because we'll have two orcs and one hobbit. Bad. If we send two hobbits, we're going to have one hobbit left over here. I think we only have one move. What should we do? Can someone volunteer a suggestion? Who should we send? Storms are coming. We've got something. We got to get across this river here. Yes. Hobbit and orc, and we'll bring the orc back again. Let's bring a hobbit and an orc and then bring, so hobbit and an orc go over. But in this case, we have violated rule number two because now we have two orcs and one hobbit on one side and they've been outnumbered. Let's, let's try another move. I think I see where you're headed here. But I think we're not there yet. So uh, orc and hobbit go back, orc stay, boat. Let's try another move. Yes. Just one orc can go over. Actually, let's all right, try. No, well, let's send two orcs. If we send two orcs, because if we only send one orc, uh, we've got to send the one, one back. I think what you're suggesting is we're going to send two orcs over. Send two orcs over. Uh, and then we're going to leave, should we leave one, we should send one work back, right? We have to, we have no choice. Um, is this sound okay? We're safe. So orc and boat. All right, now the moment of decision, we've got two orcs. We're okay over there. We're okay over here. Who goes next? 
Two hobbits go. Two hobbits go. All right, hobbits go in. Balanced. Balanced. Good. Now what happens? One hobbit gets out and one or gets in. One hobbit gets out. And one orc gets in. And one orc gets in. Okay. And they both come back. It's balanced everywhere. It's balanced everywhere. It's balanced. It's balanced. It's balanced. Okay. That looks good. I'm happy with that. Now what happens? What should we do next? We've successfully gotten two people across out of the six, but we've done a lot of back and forth. I wanted to finish by 11, so we've got to, we're getting close. <laughs> what should I do next? <laughs> and he said, yes. I think bring one hobbit and one orc back, and then we leave the hobbit there. Let's take a hobbit and an orc with the boat. We're balanced here, we're balanced there. And then we take another orc back. Is that what you're saying? No, it's not gonna work. All right, go back, go back. Let's, let's go, let's, let's reconfigure here where we were before, okay? Um, Yes. If you bring two hobbits to the other side. If we bring two hobbits to the other side, uh, that looks good. Yeah, let's try two hobbits. Okay. So we got orcs. We got a lot of hobbits. Now we have only one solution that can work for us, which is bring the orc back. Now, in any normal Middle Earth scenario, the hobbits would just take off and torch the boat and leave the orcs on the other side, but we're not doing that. Now I think the problem seems like it should solve itself, right? Because now we have orcs on one side, hobbits on the other, uh, and now we can just bring two orcs over, I think, right? And that's balanced. And then we would come back and bring the other orc over. So I think our work here is done, but let's do it just for, just so that we can really solve the problem here. Okay, orc number one, go back with the boat. Sorry, this is pointless, I realize, but at least it gets a little bit of oxygen going, right? And finally, We've success. So a round of applause for all our volunteers here. Nice work, everyone. And nice work to you for solving the problem. What was the biggest problem here? And then we'll go through and identify to have a slide that sort of shows what the problem is. So we had a couple of false starts. We had at least two or three cases uh, where what seemed like the right answer wasn't going to get there because we ended up with an imbalance. We ended up with a scenario in which we were always going to, we were going to end up with two orcs and one hobbit or that kind of thing. What seems to be the toughest part about this problem? The toughest part about this problem uh, is it requires a fair amount of working backwards, doesn't it? Uh, it requires you to get some orcs over. And then once the orcs were all here, we were, we were at a stage where we had all of the orcs on one side, all of the hobbits on the other, and then we kind of had to work methodically backwards. And that was the insight I think that you had, which is let's take all the orcs back over to the other side, move them over with hobbits. So at one point, there are several different solution paths, but they all converge on that one insight, which is you cannot solve this problem by hill climbing alone. You can't solve this problem by just trying to get closer. The only way to solve this problem is to solve it by sub goals with this means end strategy, which is we need to, first of all, satisfy the constraint of the hobbits and orcs, get the orcs away from the hobbits. And then we have to slowly switch places uh, so that the orcs are back over here and then bring them back over. So it's that uh, working backwards phase that seems to be the most difficult. So in the event that we weren't able to, like suppose nobody was here, I had a solution version of this. We're gonna blast through this ridiculously fast because we've just done this, but this is where we were. We had a bunch of orcs on one side, a bunch of hobbits. And the critical thing is we start, this was the, the critical one. We had to bring two hobbits over. Uh, to balance and, and so one of you made that suggestion two hobbits have to come over um, we bring the hobbits back over uh, and then we've got the orcs uh, on the other side here uh, and then finally uh, we ferried everybody over so it's this i've got all sorts of varieties of this but it's this stage here where we have 
we're halfway solved. We've got half of the people over, and then we end up having to move them back. That's where most people have difficulty. This is where we made the mistakes. Uh, this is not difficult. Uh, it's difficult in steps four through nine uh, because we have to work backwards. A few more examples that we'll do. Uh, we'll talk about working backwards. We're going to talk about representation. Uh, and then we'll try to maybe, maybe what we'll do is we'll pause here because the second half of the lecture is a little bit faster. Let's work through two more examples and then take a pause. Is everybody okay with that? Um, so working backwards, uh, here's a real, we're not going to solve this one. This is a really straightforward example of the importance of working backwards. Um, here's a, a problem that can only be solved by looking at the goal state. Uh, water lilies on a certain lake will double every 24 hours. So every day there are twice as many. That means one water lily divides in two, and each one of those divides in two. And that's a pretty that's, that's a pretty fast growth curve, right? Uh, so it's going to double uh, every 24 hours. From the day the first lily appears until the lake is covered takes 60 days. So basically the summer, right? Uh, when is the lake half covered? So in this 60-day period, you're all going to say the day right before day 59, right? Uh, so that's exactly right. This is an example of a problem uh, that, so if you didn't uh, hear the, the answer, of course, the answer is uh, on day 59. Because on day 59, everything doubles again. It goes from half covered to fully covered. Uh, if you were in this, pond, if you lived on this pond, you would see a pond that's half covered. And the next day, you'd wake up. Uh, the entire thing would be covered with water lilies. Um, working backwards strategy works particularly well when the goal state is well defined, but the initial state is not, which is exactly the case in that problem. We know what the goal is going to be. Everything is covered. We know how long it takes to get to the goal, but we don't know what the initial state is. So the only way to solve a problem where you know what you need, but you don't know where you are, a good strategy is to work backwards from that. Uh, and you probably find yourself doing that uh, in a lot of scenarios. Uh, let's talk about representation uh, after the break, uh, because we are at 11 o'clock. So what we're going to do is uh, we're going to cover maybe the last, uh, and it's about 15 more slides, and then we'll do a real quick bit through creativity. We should finish by 12.15 at the latest. Is that okay for everyone? It's a little bit longer than last week, but let's take a break because I feel like we sort of need that. Uh, we'll pick up right here, and then we'll hit the next half of the lecture. <laughs> I knew she was, I knew you were going to fast asleep. What? Well, I she